Good afternoon. I'm sitting here with in Walden, Colorado. Yes. Your name is? It's Sarah Carlstrom. Okay. Sarah and I met, I was asking the directions or something in the parking lot, and Sarah and I uh, talked, and you had an amazing history. So you've been in Walden for how long? 50 years. My uh, husband and I just just celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary. We um, had a big party at the Elkhorn, which is on Main Street, which is where our reception was when we got married. But it closed down in between. And But um, Jim Moore, this guy that came into our community and bought a lot of stuff, he bought it and he let us have it there because I had taught his daughter in fifth grade. So. <laughs> So 50 years, where were you born? I was born in Napa, California. Wait, and, well, you're from Napa? Uh-huh. You yeah. went east. Well, yes. I, wa I, I, went, I kept moving east because I was born in Napa because my dad was, it was after the war, but he was still in the service, and he was stationed in Vallejo, and they didn't have a hospital, sure. so I was born in Napa. And then we moved to Arizona, and then I graduated from... Uh, high school there and two years of college. Then I kept moving, moved to Las Cruces, went to New Mexico State, got my teaching degree there. And then I moved to San Antonio, Texas, did my first year of teaching. Then I moved to Dallas, did four years of teaching, went to a rodeo in Ardmore, Oklahoma, and met a bull rider from Walden, Colorado. That's why I'm here. <laughs> oh my God, that's a secure, That's a great story. That's a, to make a very long life short. That's, but then I started teaching here in 1974. But I was determined to teach because um, I was very. I loved it, and I, there was only one job available. And I told Gary, my husband, if I don't get the job, I'm not going to marry you yet. You know, until I, a job comes up and. But I got the job, so here I am. And I taught here for 35 years. And when we were first met and spoke, what was amazing is you said you now have a meeting with uh, the newspaper editor later today, and he was your student. Yeah, I don't have a meeting with him, but I told, I told you that he, he doesn't read his text messages, but he must have if he called you, huh? He finally got in touch with me, yeah. Because yeah. he, he always tells me, don't, don't write to me, just call me if you want me. But he was my student, and we're in the courthouse right now, and the assessor was my student. She was in my last class uh, in fifth grade. The treasurer and her deputy were both my students. Her deputy uh, just, she was my very, in my very first class who just turned, and they all just turned 60, who you said you did. And so you could have been in my class. The clerk is uh, was also one of my students, and my doctor, who's in town, is one of my students. So they're everywhere. <laughs> That's such. In there, how many people in town? Oh, there's only about nine hundred in our town now. It's kind of fluctuates. You know, it's gone up and down, and you know. But at this time, yeah, there's only about nine hundred. And this is uh, actually it's Walden, but it's also North Park. You know, this whole valley, if you take pictures of it, I was really shocked when I first came up here at Gary because I was, it was, it's 8,100 feet and I was expecting pine trees and mm -hmm. like an aspen or a steamboat springs, but it's very flat, it's ranch land and it's surrounded by mountains. So they call it a park, a mountain park. And there's South Park who has a cartoon and we're North Park, we don't have a cartoon. <laughs> That's, I actually have driven through South Park many, many times. Well, so what was it like? You, you, you get married, you come here, you meet a bull rider, and you're, we're how far north of uh, Steamboat Springs? We're, what is it, an hour or so? It's about 65 miles. And we're about yeah. another hour from Laramie? Yes. So we this go, is the middle of nowhere. It is absolutely the middle of nowhere. Very small town, very little industry, ranching, tourists, but we don't have a ski resort or anything like that, you know. Good fishing, good hunting. We get a lot of hunters and a lot of fishermen. But as far as, you know, if I, if I hadn't have been a teacher, it would have been hard for me to find something, you know, to, to do. do up here that I could make money at. Well, so 
I guess for my listeners and viewers, <coughs> what was it like living, especially back in the day? I mean, now it's still it's still in the middle of nowhere, but back in the day, what was it like? I mean, you were in, born in Napa, which was wine country back then. I assume, correct? Still correct? Wine what? Wine country. Yes. Yes. What was life like here? Well, I was little then, but I came here from Dallas, Texas, <coughs> and it is you know. It's kind of the fashion industry, and the, uh, you know, it has a big city, so it was kind of a cultural shock <laughs> for me to come here because there's nowhere to shop, you know, and no, not any great places to go eat or theaters and things like that. But <coughs> sorry, I can. Get your go ahead. I'm grab a soda drink. Um, I uh, but it was a great place to teach. The kids were wonderful. I love my students. I still hear from a lot of them um, all the time. And like I said, they're all over town also. One of them even owns the Stockman Bar. You know, one of my students. I think I was there for bre they have breakfast at the restaurant no, too? That's, no, that, at the River Rock probably. Oh, at the River Rock, yeah. 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 Oh, so you've been here all these years and how has town changed over those decades? Has it changed much? Well, for a while, it didn't change at all. And we, we actually, for a while, we were listed as one of the dying towns, one of the top 100 dying towns. But um, this, I mean, we're the only town in Colorado that doesn't have a stoplight. <laughs> we don't have a stoplight. Did you notice that? <laughs> I, I did notice that, actually, yeah. yeah. And it, when I first came, there were a lot more kids in the school. There were, uh, you know, two two classes for each grade level. Mm -hmm. And now it's the, it's gone way down. So it's, you know, the, we some of the classes. My son teaches here now. And that's another cool thing. And a lot, a couple, quite a few of my former students teach there, teach at our school. Anyway, now some of the classes are only like eight, nine. Probably the, one of the largest classes might be 15. So this is your county seat as well. Which county? Jackson County. So you're, you're, well, you'd be one of those western towns that's kind of losing population. But it seems, I mean, People stay. What's the allure? I mean, you're losing some, but obviously some are staying, staying as well. What did you enjoy about being here as opposed to being in... Uh, Big city or something. In yeah. Dallas or wherever. Yeah. I, well, for one thing, it's, I had two boys, and it's a great place to raise children. You don't worry about them going downtown or driving around or, you know, anything. They, you know, the people, I mean, they, we know everybody, and so... Um, I don't know. I I got where I, first I was kind of you know missed a lot of the stuff that big cities give us. But then when it came down to it, it's just really nice to. It's a peaceful um, life. You know, we we know our neighbors. We you don't go to the post office without stopping and talking to people or the bank. And it's just a small town atmosphere, and it's. It's really nice, and now I go to the big city, and there's so much traffic, and yeah. <laughs> can't wait to get back here. <laughs> well, so when you look at, I mean, if we look at, as you know, I'm traveling and uh, sort of asking people how they see the country today, and, and, and I'm obviously looking at the division, and the whole, the whole uh, theme of the podcast is that we have far more in common than apart, but then I've also been traveling under the kind of... Uh, cheeky concept of do we hate each other this much I mean I think we discussed I think this town's probably a bit more homogenous it probably leans conservative and that's just the way it is is that accurate pretty much yeah they but there's um, there's a lot of people that see the changes and they're not because you know Colorado has kind of turned a little more liberal through the years but our county has stayed pretty conservative and um, but I don't feel like we hate each other for not because there's still a lot there's a lot of liberal people in this town too and um, I think they they accept each other even if they don't agree with it and this you know this 
political atmosphere in our country right now is just so awful. You know, I just don't understand why we can't, myself, growing up and even, um, you know, being an adult through the years, didn't, you don't hate people because they don't agree with you, because they don't agree with your views. You disagree, and that's fine. You know, disagree, but you don't hate them because of it. And, and that's what I feel like is kind of going on now. People are just, they say such hateful things about people they don't even know. Do you think, I, I've said for a long time that I think that with what larger cities provide and what social media does in a more dramatic way is, there's no consequence for our words that, that are said. Uh, I mean, we don't know one another perhaps we're in these larger metropolitan areas or we're anonymous online or certainly not in the neighborhood. I mean, do you feel that in a small town like this, people are maybe better behaved for maybe the, the social ramifications, but just because it's your neighbor and you care for each other? Yeah, I think that's a lot of it. And because cause they do, they will probably be, you know, get some slash back if they do say things that are out of line. And so I think that kind of keeps them in line, you know, because they care what other people think about them and they care what, um, you know, how other people feel about them and they don't want, I don't know, but some people don't care, I guess, but I haven't really found it. We have a lot of really good people in our town and um, at least they've always treated me really well. And 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 when I first came up here though, I was kind of, I mean, I came from Dallas and I, this was back when, um, mini skirts, you know, and boots and hot pants we wore and came up here and I stood out like a sore thumb because Gary brought, my husband brought me up here and you wouldn't believe the looks that I got and because <laughs> they, they weren't dressing like that up here. And, uh, but then so once they got to know me, you know, they accepted me and, and I, was, I was good. And I've been here ever since and I'm happy to be here. That's a. I, I like that you went from. I mean, Napa's changed so much. The whole country's changed in the time frame we're discussing, and then Dallas has certainly changed. But but I think if you were to look outside and uh, look at the tenor of the country, and I mean, you've obviously gone into the urban markets, maybe wherever Denver or whatever. When you look at that now, I guess I ask people. In. Do they have hope for the future? I think I, I meet a lot of people who are really down. The division is very heavy. Um, a lot of Americans are struggling. We, a lot of cases we've lost our middle class, and certainly this is more dramatic. And I mean, you were in Dallas. I mean, Dallas has been an affluent city for many years due to the oil and so forth. When you look outside the country, if you read the media or newspapers or news or whatever, how do you see the country now? I mean, do you, what's your level of of uh, how would you describe what you see? Well, it, it's scary. You know, and I, of course, being an ex-teacher, the school shootings, the shootings just slay me. You know, we, even when my kids went, and they're both in their early 40s now, but even when we went, we didn't worry about that. Yeah. You know, nothing like that happened. And, but that and then, you know, all the 9-11 and all the horrible things, I know it is to me. It's very scary, and I, I don't have any grandkids. I wished I did. My boys haven't helped me out with that, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but if I did, I certainly. And I have a lot of students whose kids I know well, and it it scares me for them what might come about just because of all the anger and mental illness that I guess that causes you know, all this traumatic things that are going on. And we've always had wars, you know, when I grew up, that they were always over somewhere else, you know, but um, the things that are happening in, in America are really scary to me. And I, I don't know what you do about it, but I would worry if I had a child growing up right now in America. 
You know, as a former teacher, I've often thought about, we just didn't have these school shootings when, no. when you know, I was a kid and I, I look at, you know, when these began and there's research and psychology on this, but I just think about, there was no precedent for a person my age to even comprehend. We, there was no, there was no newspaper or news program showing someone else a few years older than me having done something like this and yet today it's in the news all the time yeah. and, and I guess going back to your career in teaching and being here that's the thing we couldn't comprehend you didn't know it existed correct no not at all I wouldn't even have thought in a million years that something like that would happen you know we just we didn't lock the schools we don't didn't lock our doors we didn't you know we didn't worry about it and especially me growing up you know, there was nothing like that. We we went out, my mother, in the, especially in the summer when school wasn't going on, we'd go out, ride our bicycles, come in for lunch, go back out. Mom said, make sure you're home for supper. And she didn't worry about where we were, what we were doing or anything. And it'd be a little scary these days. Kids in our town still kind of do that. But so many kids now are inside playing video games and a lot of them aren't out playing like we did. And I kind of feel bad for that, for kids didn't enjoy, and you too, when you grew up, you know, you get, I'm sure you were outside most of the time. I would just go on my bicycle and I would ride the whole day out far yeah. from where I lived and just come home and we would play, you know, we would play together in the neighborhood, basketball, soccer, whatever, and mm -hmm. it was kind of like, it was just a neighborhood feeling where you had Friends, we all knew one another for the most part. There was really no strangers, and uh, I mean, exactly. this was uh, you know yeah. suburban Chicago, but it was that's that was life back then. I did have a question because we are in rural northern Colorado, northeastern Colorado, I suppose, or actually northern Colorado. And the other thing, when I look at if we look at firearms, I, I back in the day, I mean, you know. Kids carried them to school in their trucks. Just because they were going to go hunting or yeah. get a rabbit or whatever. They always had them back there in their trucks when, yeah. You know, and it, now you can't, no. Yeah, it's, and they, I, I don't remember hearing anything about the automatic, you know, rifles and stuff like that. They were 22s or, yeah. you know. Yeah, one uh, shot rifle. And, exactly, yeah. I know. It. Is that, so in town here, I guess when you, I'm not sure whether this happens, but do you ever speak with your husband or friends or relatives or other people in town? If you all talk about these things, what's the dialogue if you do speak about it? Is there anything you could say to that? I'm just curious, I'm just really curious how a town like this sees maybe, because you're, you're a distance away, I mean, this is a removed space. Mm -hmm. The closest towns are not very big big cities. 65 miles is the closest town, and you're right, it's not very big. Laramie is probably the biggest one. Fort Collins is 100 miles, and that's, yeah, we're pretty isolated here. But, but hunting is a big thing, and, you know, most of the kids go hunting, you know, and they have guns, and um, I'm not sure what... So when, when, I'm not sure what your question was. Well, I guess to me, as I drove in, and I, haven't, I think I drove this years and years ago when my kids were little, the space out here is immense. It is spectacular. It's just stunning scenery. I, I think that I would tell most people, if you want to see beauty, travel the American West. It's mm -hmm. just spectacular. But I think that to me, there's a psychic space and there's a physical space. And I guess the point of the question was, to me, you have both. You've got the physical space, and yes, we can get 100 miles pretty quickly, but still, there's a, yeah. a psychic space as well. Do you feel distant from what's happening in the country, or does it feel very present to you? No, well, yeah, unfortunately, it's pretty present because of media and everything. You know, we, yeah, the news is always on us and social media and everything. Yeah, it's, I guess, I guess maybe the answer is a little of both. I mean, we're, we're in it because of the media and because, but we're away from it because we're so far up here, you know, where we don't, we don't experience anything like that. You know, we haven't had any mass shootings or kids kidnapped or anything like that. Um, 
it wouldn't be hard probably for somebody to come into our town and kidnap a kid, but because the kids just run around everywhere, you know, but it hasn't happened, thank God, and we hope that it won't ever happen, but um, I don't know. So I guess a little of both. We kind of, we're kind of isolated that way, which is nice, but we can't help from being right in the middle of it because of the news and, you know, all the media. So given, like, you were, were you kind of in that generational contemporaries, we have a similar kind of uh, timeline in ways. When you look at the country today, and of course back then we had the Vietnam War, we had, we had all these, you know, the, we had the Cold War, et cetera, et cetera. Does that feel to you when you look back and you look at today, and of course hindsight's difficult to go back in time, but do you feel like we're at a better place, a worse place? Are you concerned, hopeful? How do you, what's your overall feeling about how you feel about this time in history, both for the world and for the country? I do feel like it's a worse time just because of all the anger and um, pandemic didn't help. You know, I think the pandemic brought a lot of, I don't know what it did, it just stopped a lot of stuff, but made everybody mad, <laughs> I Do don't you, know. Even here? <laughs> yeah, well, not as much though. We did, we were lucky here because, in fact, my son, who I told you was teaching here, He's a big city boy, and he taught for four years in Prague, and he fought, taught for two years in Mexico City, and then he taught in Denver. And he moved up here uh, when the pandemic was going on because it was so awful down in Denver. You know, he couldn't go out, or he couldn't see his friends, he couldn't do anything. They were, you know, homeless were camping you know, on the, they could camp, you know, here's the sidewalk and here's his apartment complex and there's that space between the sidewalk and the road and his, there were just tents everywhere and it, I never thought he would ever live back here in this little town because he couldn't wait to get out of it. But he did come back because of the pandemic. But I, I do think it's worth worse just because of all the shootings and the, you know, so many things. And the anger, it just seems like people are angry. And sometimes I don't even know if they know why they're angry. They're just angry. And they have so much hate for their fellow man that they don't even know. Like I told you earlier, a guy came in here and he just said, he was, and I've told him before, because I've talked to him before, and I said, I don't want to talk politics, but he said something about the Democrats. And I said, I told you I don't want to talk politics, so you just need to leave. And he said, okay, but I just hate Democrats. And I went, what, who, which Democrats? Do you, who do you know that's Democrat? Who is it that you hate? You know, this could be your neighbor, you don't know for sure who's a Democrat or who's a Republican or what. You know, you can't, you can't just hate someone because of their political affiliation, you know. It's like, and, I, and, and I, I've always been, well, right now I'm unaffiliated because I, I try to vote for who I think is going to do the best job. I don't care whether they're a Democrat or a Republican. I'm going to vote for the person that I want to vote for, so... And I've always been that way. Yeah, I say that, you know, our, our, our neighbors are probably not our enemy. And it just, and we discussed, I think when we spoke outside, that this wasn't the case in the past. We didn't have this politicization in every know. area of our li life. And um, to me, I've been saying a long time, it's almost like it's, it's a, was a low grade fever that's become, you know, a, a, a raging fever. And uh, I, I think that the mental health impact of yes. the fear, the distrust, the disdain, and uh, yeah, the discourse, I, I guess, I and mean, the question, when I look at the way we speak, and you were a teacher, have, have you noticed, certainly I see this, a coarsening, uh, a lack of decorum, and these are big words that sound very prissy, but there was a certain uh, dignity in how we talked, I think, back in the day. I mean, without even knowing it, it wasn't like it was even a thing, we just didn't... Has that changed here at all, or do you notice that, or has it just sort of still been sort of a polite society here in, in your town? 
Well, I, I do think the kids going through our school system do not speak or write as well as they used to. Um, well, they especially write, you know, because there's so much computer mm -hmm. and everything, and they, they don't know grammar, they, uh, and they don't speak as well. I, I do think that that has gone down. Um, and I, I, yeah, I don't know about the dialogue or anything. It's, it seems like it's, I don't know, it does seem like it's took a bit of a dip. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I want to thank you for meeting with me. Uh, one last question, I suppose. Where do you find um, in your own life at this point, um, where have you found uh, contentment and happiness and satisfaction and joy? I mean, in, in your life here in Walden and what's been important to you? Family, friends. Um, I love music. I play the guitar and I have a group that we sing different things. We laugh and say we sing for weddings, funerals, and bar mitzvahs, but we don't really sing for bar mitzvahs. But um, there's six of us. We're all getting older now. I love to dance. I teach line dance lessons to senior citizens, mostly ladies, but I have a few guys once in a while. And so things like that that I enjoy. But family, friends, loved ones, that's, that's where I'm happiest, you know spending time like that. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. What do you think why, what do you think has caused the anger and the split between people hating each other for whatever reason? Oh, as you know, it's a big question for me. I've now spent many years traveling the country and uh, have looked into this. I, I just uh, briefly, I think we've lived in a time of immense systemic change with the, um, in almost every domain of life, uh, immense technological change and impact in how we live our lives, uh, especially devices, have changed the way we communicate, how we interact. I think relationship has changed. Certainly we've had a hugely growing population. So we now have, I saw systems kind of straining. So if I travel the country, I saw a lot of things were, I, I saw systems kind of failing to do their job. And mm -hmm. I think that, we live in a time when it's, you know, fire, fire, blame. And I think, well, geez, you know, how hard is it to be a police officer? How hard is it to be a school teacher? How hard is it to run any kind of organization or entity when you're dealing with so much sheer volume, so much change, so much demand, um, and in many cases, uh, you know, scarcity and complexity. I, I just think it's become a very complex, crowded world and I think a lot yes. of people are doing their best, but I do think that certainly there uh, are other, I think I go to values, and, and I think I go to the fabric of our society and what we really value as a society. And I think that's changed a lot, or maybe it's been amplified in the past 30 or 40 years. Um, and I think that's you know, certainly one part of it. Yeah, I th you know, I agree. We've always tried to keep up with the Joneses or whatever like that, but it seems worse now that you have to, you know, you work your life away to make money and do what, you know, and you get, you get my age and you really realize that um, money isn't gonna, isn't gonna buy you happiness, it's not gonna help your health, I mean, it might, but I don't think so. Even if you get the best doctors, you know, if, if it's not going to happen. And it's just, it's sad. How much do you think uh, technology has to do with everything? Well, I can go back to the around 2010, 11, 12, when I saw the impact of video gaming in my own family. And then I saw how having cell phone use, I mean, I, I'm not dinging these, things wholeheartedly, like, you know, just across the board, but I just saw that we had changes in the way our society functions. So for example, we had team sports. And so in, with my kids, all of a sudden I'm driving them an hour or two to get to symphony and soccer. You've got travel teams. And when I grew up, you played, I mean, yeah. you might travel, what, maybe a, 10 miles or something. Yeah, yeah, a few times a year, but 
it, it didn't become this kind of full on production. And so I think that that changed how families live, it changed how we parent, it changed how uh, the family structure and cohesiveness. I, I think it changed some power dynamics and how parents were able to parent, I suppose. I mean, because mm-hmm. you've now got competing authority figures and you've got your kids have uh, other bright, shiny objects. And I'm, I'm not dinging these you know, across the board, but certainly I think that's it's made a changed. Difference. Yeah. It's made Yeah, that's changed. And, um, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I just, I, I guess my mantra is whatever we're gaining, I always wonder at what cost and do what we we're realize losing. what we're losing. Mm-hmm. And I think that we live in a society that's always been fast, fast, innovate, grow. And I guess a question I have for anyone is are we happier? Are we more content? Do we love each other as much? Do we. So I went by the cemetery, just you know, just across yeah. from the gas station. And one of my interests is, is human performance and longevity. I don't know how many 90-year-old gravestones I found there of people born in the 1800s. Mm-hmm. And you think about, okay, well, there was really no medicine back then. I mean, mm-hmm. it's like really you couldn't call it medicine. How did they live so long? Yeah. Well, we could draw, we could make a hypothesis about how they did. And if you look at the Harvard study in human development and other things, the biggest predictor of many things is the cohesiveness of, of family, family and community. Mm-hmm. I agree, yeah. And I, and I worry about it as a former teacher, too, because they say the kids' brains are changing because of you know the technology and the cell phones and the video games. And it's just, they're actually, their brains are different than they were just if they've been you know, uh, exposed to that all their lives. So I worry about what, I mean, like my kids didn't have cell phones till they got to college, you know, and they did have video games, but they were like, what, Sega? Uh, yeah. Yeah, and they weren't on them all the time. And I don't know, as, as a, when I, I sub still at school and I, I, I really get tired of the cell phones. You know, they're supposed to put them in a thing when they come in, and but a lot of them don't, you know. And what, what are you supposed to do, search them or something? And they'll have them hiding them here, hiding them, you know. And, they, and I don't know, I think, gosh, I'm glad I didn't have to deal with that. <laughs> well, you know, I, I was up in, I came, drove through Steamboat, and I popped into a, a coffee house and a bar just to catch up on emails and so forth. And as I travel, there's screens everywhere. There's it, and the other funny thing I noticed a few years ago was there's music everywhere. There's there's hotels. There's always music. There's always screens. And again, you can't put a cork in the bottle. But I do look at how we relate to one another as human beings. So in this room here, it's mostly quiet. We had a little bit of noise coming in, but. There's something about, to me, uh, in this sound, this is probably going to sound awfully silly and kind of ridiculous, but we just live in a noisy world. Mm-hmm. We live in an intrusive world. And, you know, we adapt. Human beings adapt. And, and I guess as we adapt, I just wonder whether some of the division, some of the fear, some of the anger is made possible by the fact that it's so hard to be present. It, it, it's, I just think it's hard to be, it's difficult to be present when we have so many stimuli around us. And it also opens a door to, well, I don't like the way she looks or the way he looks or they, they I just think it's, it's right now, if, if we were to have a disagreement, there's nothing else distracting us here. Mm-hmm. We're two people right across from each other. And I guess my question is, you know, what is the impact on this? Nothing's going to change. We're not going to sh- stop this. But I guess... Is it going to get more so? And, well, I, and with AI, yes. Sure so I, I guess the question is... Because with AI, and it's getting kind of scary. I um, That's the other reason I'm not sure I want to be a teacher because I was an English teacher too and just having to decide whether the kids are stealing what they get, you know, from AI, because you can just put in, put in Abraham Lincoln, write me an essay, and it'll have it, and 
three seconds or three minutes, maybe not three seconds, but yeah, or even a story, you know, give them a, but my son who teaches English here, he's trying to figure out how to use AI to his advantage, you know, in the classroom, and which is good. I wouldn't know how to do that, but. <laughs> Well, I, I, I do see, on, on the more optimistic and I think invigorating side, I think we live in fascinating times. It's unprecedented. Yeah, and that's I, true. I, I push back. I say this is an inflection point in, 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 in world history. And uh, in that sense, I mean, look what we can do here. I've got a camera that's shooting essentially a, a cinema quality video of you, hopefully, if it's in focus. And um, I can literally put it up to, I couldn't have dreamt in my early career as a journalist and publisher to yeah. get this to so many people potentially as I can today and I guess that is the one constant is change and I think what you said I think part of what I believe is it's who you're who's on your left and your right who you're going down the road with mm -hmm. and I think that my take on living in a more in the mountain communities or more rural community is you do have an ability for um, maybe a bit more intimacy that's uh, than is able and maybe a larger urban market or at least certainly in a different way in a slower pace of life um, and certainly that's true here in in your town I mean there's just not a whole lot to do <laughs> no not really although I seem to keep really busy but I know I I know and I shouldn't and I'm really not cutting down technology it's just I see I see problems but I also like you said I don't know how I ever got anywhere without my GPS and I and when I was teaching, and I taught the kids to, we sang and danced a lot, and I had to carry this big boom box, you know, all the time, and now I have one this size, you know, that's just as loud or maybe louder than this one was. And so there's a lot of advantages to things like that, but, um, other, but I don't know. I. I worry about the writing skills. Kids, they don't write like they used to even, I mean, because they stopped teaching um, hand, you know, cursive. And when I sub, I can't even write in cursive on the board because they can't read it. Oh. And and that was always my, because I, before I retired, I remember my superintendent asking if we should still teach cursive and I said, I thought we should just so kids could read it. Our Declaration of Independence is in cursive, you know, our grandparents' letters and things like that. The kids won't be able to read them because I'd had kids come from other schools that didn't learn cursive and they can't read it. You know, you would think they could, but no, you write it, you, you write it down and they have no idea what it, says well that's i think there you go that's a it's it's time marches on one question that um i track you're 78 what is your secret to being <laughs> in such amazing shape at 78 i what do you uh, yoga pilates a meditation practice what do you do well there's a couple things one i'm lucky hereditary wise i have not turned gray and my parents weren't gray when they died, and they died in their 70s, but... Well, your, your hair color is natural, yes, you haven't turned gray. I've never, I've never colored my hair, you know, so that helps. But um, the basic things is, when you get old, don't gain too much weight. If you gain too much weight, your knees, your ankles, hips, everything goes. I've never had any kind of, you know, replacements. Um, you shouldn't smoke. Smoking even worse than drinking. I mean, drinking too much, definitely also. But smoking, a lot, so many people. My husband and my my husband's eighty, and he's he gets around great too. Um, but neither one of us have smoked. The ones are a lot of cousins and friends have gotten cancer at our age usually, and die. And basically, uh, keep moving. You know, keep, keep even if you kind of hurt, even if you have some arthritis or something, don't sit, you know, keep moving. And, and socialize. To me, 
you know, especially when it comes to all, all, all timers or something like that, you know, you need to socialize. That I preach this to my line dance ladies because, you know, they come and they talk to each other, they socialize before we dance. The dances are really good to learn, you know, they help the brain, plus they're getting physical exercise. And those are basically my, <laughs> my preaches that I try to say, you know, to people, just keep moving, you know, don't drink or smoke too much, uh, don't gain too much weight, socialize. Well, and there you have it. I think that that's, and again, I think the cemetery kind of proved that. I'm wondering what those people did. I'm so, sure some of them were ranchers, but... Uh, they play wanna... cards back in those days because yeah. Gary right. talks about his parents. They got, and they were, they were ranchers, and they'd get together on the weekends with other ranchers, and they'd play cards, and they'd drink probably, you know, too, but just have, they'd get together at each other's houses and, you know, do stuff like that. And it's a throwback was, time. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Oh, it's been great meeting you, and, and good luck with your further, you know, ex adventures. But I'm very excited. It's a big trip ahead of me. Yeah. It's, it's been, um, I think Matt, I'm going to take a break and get ready for Matt, but um, it's, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate it. Well, tell him who you talk to and see what he says. I sure will. He's such, such a funny character when, you know, I told you how I like to dance. And I used to, uh, when he was in my class, um, we for Christmas we would have a little dance over at the gym. His mother wouldn't let him go. She thought, I mean, if she'd just come and looked, you know, she thought dancing led to bad thoughts. They were in fifth grade. You know, they don't even <laughs> want to touch each other. You know, they were like this, you know, but... Uh, anyway, he didn't get to go, so he had to stay and play games. Then we all came back from the dance, and uh, and we had the music on. And I turned around, and he was on. He was on a desk dancing. You know? oh my God. <laughs> I went, Matthew, get down. <laughs> but, That's funny. But he's he's a character. You'll like him. Um, he's trying to sell me the paper before we even met. Yeah, what? <laughs> He's trying to sell me the newspaper before he even met. <laughs> the whole paper. The whole yeah, paper. Yeah, yeah, I know. He, I think yes. he wants out of the newspaper he's, business. He's been trying. He, he's been trying to get it sold. He's tired of it. You know, I, um, I told him from the beginning. I appreciate. If he hadn't have bought it, we wouldn't have had a paper in our town. You know, and, a lot, and don't tell him this, but a lot of people criticize him, which you do. People do because. They do that, but I said, you know, I told you, don't listen to it. We, we appreciate you buying it because if we hadn't had it, if you hadn't bought it, we wouldn't have a paper at all. And you know how much it means for these kids. Like if you, if they win the spelling bee and they're on the front page of the paper, it doesn't matter. It's a little podunk paper. They're on the front page of a paper, and it, the basketball kids, the ba volleyball kids, you know. It's wonderful to have them. And I have a whole scrapbook full of my kids through the years from on the Jackson County Star. <laughs> <laughs> That's... And, and I'm in a lot of them too because I, you know, through the years teaching, I was always doing sponsoring stuff or doing something. And yeah, it's, it's great. You'll like meeting him, but you can ask him about me. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm looking forward says. to uh, talking <laughs> with him. Well, I better knock this down. Um, okay. Where, can you give me your info so I can try to have it? To